Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry, and thanks to the others who have joined on this rainy night. Um, if you live in Philadelphia and you're interested in the arts or literature, you know about Larry Robbins and the role he's played in promoting that. Um, it's just an incredible honor to uh, uh, be part of uh, this salon because I know some of the history and I know uh, how many artists and how many writers uh, have been influenced by Larry and most of all have benefited from his support. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, the illustrator of this book, who's Signe Wilkinson, who recently retired uh, after 40 years of incredible cartooning for the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, uh, uh, which, among other things, uh, won her the Pulitzer Prize. And as I like to say to my friends, you know, you'll never forget your first Pulitzer, right? I mean, the others have been nice, uh, but that first one, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, Signe actually came up with the idea for this book. She had seen columns uh, that I had written about free speech, and she asked me for coffee, and she says, I want you to write a book about free speech, and I'll illustrate it. And that's exactly what happened, and I really think that the cartoons are the story of the book because they, they capture ideas in a way that, that words don't, or at least, uh, at least my words don't. Uh, and um, working with a genius like that, which is really what she is, has been one of the highlights of my career. So that's the story of the book, but let me tell you about the, the story that begins the book. Um, the story that begins the book is um, a couple years ago uh, at my class at Penn, um, I hosted Mary Beth Tinker, who you see with her brother John in this, in this photograph. And that's probably a name you've heard because when Mary Beth Tinker was 13 years old at Warren Harding Middle School in Des Moines, Iowa, she wore a black armband to protest America's involvement in the Vietnam War. And her brother wore the same and they were sent home. They were at different schools. And uh, they eventually lured up and that's the case that became Tinker v. Des Moines. Um, when in 1969, uh, the court said actually they could wear those armbands and that uh, students and teachers do not shed their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. Uh, anyway, Mary Beth Tinker is not that much older than I am. And she came to my class, this is a couple of years ago, and she told her story. She even brought the, the original armband uh, and put it on students, which I thought was delightful. But of course, the historian in me was like, shouldn't that be in the National Archives? You know, I mean, uh, uh, do you also have an original copy of the Declaration in your purse? Anyway, she does her story and then the questions start and um, the student said, look, uh, Ms. Tinker, you were fighting the good fight. You were fighting the, the war in Vietnam. This Milo Yiannopoulos guy and this Ann Coulter jokester and this Ben Shapiro person, um, these sexists and these racists, they just wanna hurt people and we need to prevent that. Well, Mary Beth Tinker was not having it. And this is what she said. She said, listen, at my middle school in Des Moines, there were kids who had dads and brothers and uncles that were fighting and dying in Southeast Asia. Do you think they weren't hurt by this snot-nosed kid wearing this symbol saying that their loved ones were risking everything for a lie? You don't think that hurt them? If that's what you think, maybe you have to think some more. Of course it hurt them. Speech hurts, speech offends. But she said, look, if that becomes your rubric for what's allowed, forget about my speech, because I was certainly offending and hurting people, and ultimately forget about all speech. And the students took this in and they said, well, it's Ms. Tinker. Isn't this free speech discussion all an abstraction? Isn't this just about who has power and who doesn't? Like, isn't the real reason that like a white guy like Zimmerman loves to talk about free speech is, you know, he wants to protect his power. Um, uh, and Mary Beth Tinker was not having that either. And she said, listen, in 1965 at Warren G. Harding Middle School, I was a 13 year old girl. I didn't have any power. Speech was the only power that I had. And so if you take away the right to free speech, it's actually the people at the bottom, the people with the least power, kids 
racial minorities, um, uh, sexual minorities who were going to suffer. And Signe, I thought, captured a lot of these dynamics brilliantly uh, in, in what is my favorite cartoon in the whole book, uh, which is uh, this one. Um, every great warrior for social justice in the history of this country was also a warrior for free speech. Frederick Douglass, Susan B. Anthony, and yes, Martin Luther King Jr. Because they understood that again, speech was all they had. And if you took it away, they would have nothing. And the fact that people will be offended or hurt by it, well, you know, I'm sure Bull Connor was in some ways hurt by what King was saying. Um, people do get hurt, their feelings get hurt, speech hurts, but that can't be a reason to shut it down or there won't be speech at all. Um, so what I thought I would do is just um, explain to you that the reason I wrote this book to be as honest as possible is I'm a teacher and a father of young adults, both in their 20s, two brilliant young women uh, um, who I love maniacally. And one of the things I discovered through my students and through my daughters is that free speech has now, especially on college campuses, has been coded as a conservative thing. It's something people on Fox News like because they bleed on about cancel culture. Uh, and the people who want free speech are obviously Republicans or Trumpers or some such thing. And because I'm a historian, I decided to write this book to try to show otherwise and to look backwards into history, which is what we have to do, to remind ourselves about the radical roots, the radical importance, the radical potential of free, uh, uh, the, the, the radical potential of free speech. Um, uh, what has it done? Here's the, here's the argument uh, uh, of the book. There, there are four of them. The book is called uh, Free Speech and Why You Should Give a Damn. Uh, and there are four reasons actually that you should give a damn. And here they are. Um, free speech allows us to criticize our leaders. It allows racial minorities, women, uh, sexual minorities, working class Americans to challenge their oppression. Um, it allows us to create and enjoy the art, film, and literature by choice, like a Henry Miller novel that Larry alluded to. And it allows students and teachers to speak their minds in school. Now, I want to emphasize, friends, and this is the real reason I wrote this book, is that all of these values have been observed in the breach. That is, they've all been violated and neglected and ignored across our history. And that's why I wrote the book. We need awareness of that past so we're vigilant about protecting these rights because they have been so often ignored or neglected. Um, so let's start with the first one, criticizing our leaders. Um, you don't get this from Hamilton, but as soon as we made a nation, we started jailing dissidents. Um, so when I, when I say Hamilton, of course, I'm talking about the brilliant, uh, the brilliant musical play which I love, but one of the things that leaves out is this nasty little episode called the Alien and Sedition Acts. So 10 years after we become a country, um, France uh, starts, um, uh, 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 it starts attacking American vessels, demanding bribes, and it looks like we might go to war with France, which we never did, but it seemed imminent. And so under John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, the United States passed a law saying you're gonna get fined or jailed if you write, print, or utter, quote, false, scandalous, and malicious writing against the government of the United States. In other words, they made dissent illegal 10 years into the history of the United States. Uh, and the argument then was really the same uh, as any argument we've seen during moments of national crisis since, which is there's a war on. Why let anyone play for the other team? Why do that? Um, if you're playing for the other team, we've got to blot you out because we're trying to win. And indeed, uh, that happened during the Civil War as well, which is a chapter that um, a lot of us don't like to think or talk about. Um, but one of the things that happened during the, during the Civil War uh, is that the government of Abraham Lincoln, the Union government, jailed thousands of people who criticized the Civil War. Um, 
closed uh, over 300 newspapers. Uh, and um, this created a great deal of, of, uh, of, of um, controversy. Can you, you, can, you can see, uh, Larry just nodded, you can see Lincoln, uh, oh, great emancipator. Uh, Larry, can you see the cartoon? Yeah, good. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, people made some really interesting arguments. Here's Lincoln. He says, armies cannot be maintained unless desertion shall be punished by death. Must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts? Well, I must never touch a hair of a wily agitator who induces him to desert. So look, there's a war going on. Um, why should I let anyone play for the other team? Well, never mind that Abraham Lincoln, as a young congressman, had criticized James Polk in the Mexican War. Um, never mind that Union soldiers were going to their deaths singing the battle cry of freedom, um, which obviously closing newspapers violated. And Lincoln came to the same conclusion ultimately. Um, he revoked his order to close the Chicago Times in his home state of Illinois. And he scolded uh, his own generals for closing other papers. And that began this history of censors coming to regret their censorship. Uh, and moving on to the, uh, 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 to the Second World War, I'm sorry, the First World War, um, what you see then is you see another round of censorship um, uh, you see pacifists and socialists thrown into jail. And the courts allowed that. And in fact, Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a famous decision allowing the jailing of Charles Schenck, who was the secretary of the Socialist Party here in the city of brotherly love. Schenck had distributed flyers urging draft resistance. And it was in the Schenck case that Oliver Wendell Holmes said, Freedom of speech does not include falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. Everyone always leaves out the falsely, which bums me out. Because if there's a real fire, you should shout, right? Um, what Holmes said is freedom of speech doesn't include uh, um, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. Again, there's a war on. And these, these um, uh, anti-draft, anti-conscription pamphlets are going to hurt the war effort. Well just like Lincoln ends up regretting shuttering the Chicago Times, Oliver Wendell Holmes very quickly came to regret this decision. Just a year later, in the Abrams case, there's this guy who's arrested for distributing Yiddish pamphlets, i.e. pamphlets in Yiddish, criticizing the, the American invasion of Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution. Most Americans don't know this, although they should, but after the Bolshevik Revolution, the United States did invade Russia. And um, uh, these, these Yiddish pamphlets criticized that. Abrams was arrested and the court upheld that, but this time Holmes is in dissent. Just a year later, he says, this is not the equivalent of falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. This is not a clear and present danger. And what he says is at the same time, I understand it and I deplore it. He says, this is my favorite Holmes line. He says, persecution for the expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt about your premises or your power and you want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. What he's saying is that censorship makes a terrible kind of sense. It's natural in a way, right? You see something that's horrible. You see something that violates things that are intimate and hugely significant to you. Holmes says, like, grant the censor this. It's quite natural to want to stamp it out. And that's precisely why we need to resist the impulse. Because it is so natural and so seductive. And friends, most, most people don't know this, but it's not until the Vietnam War that courts in America would uphold the right of people to criticize the government during wartime. And I was alive then. I'm not that old. So it's in my own lifetime that a 19-year-old college student named Cohen walks into a draft board wearing a jacket that said, fuck the draft. And he was arrested on one of these kind of sedition type wartime laws. And ultimately the court said that that was protected speech. But now we're into 1971. Um, uh, so I think it's really important to remember just how recent this right is this right to criticize the government in wartime, and also how tenuous it is. 
And unless you look back in time, it's easy to forget that. So that's number one. It lets us criticize our leaders. Number two, which is closely related, is it allows, again, racial and gender and sexual minorities to criticize their circumstances and indeed their oppression. Let's remember that the first mass censorship campaign in the United States begins right after Nat Turner's rebellion, 1831. Why? Because the, the slaveholding, the white supremacist class in the South especially gets terrified and starts passing laws preventing the US males from distributing abolitionist literature. Ultimately, they even won a law preventing the distribution of anti-slavery petitions on the floor of Congress. Um, uh, that's how powerful the so-called slave power was. And obviously abolitionists criticized this, including Frederick Douglass. And he goes to Boston in 1860 and he says, free speech is the great moral renovator of society. He says to suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. It's just as criminal to rob a man of his right to speak and hear as it would be to rob him of his money. So look, Douglas, the leading abolitionist of his time, he's obviously trying to get the word out about the evil of slavery. If you censor him, he can't get the word out. And that goes for all the other social justice movements. Think about suffrage, right? We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of that amendment. Suffragists are denied permits for marches. They're brutalized by mobs while cops look the other way. Or think about the related campaign, very closely related to suffrage, for birth control. Let me just get that, get that up here. Um, that's Margaret Sanger, of course. Uh, and um, you should know that, of course, she's the, the, the godmother of um, Planned Parenthood and really of birth control services in this country. And um, she was indicted on four counts of obscenity in, in, uh, in 1914 for publishing information about contraception. In her magazine, which incidentally was called, just saying, The Woman Rebel, she's facing a 45-year jail sentence. So she flees the United States, she goes to the UK, when the charges are dropped, she comes back and embarks on a speaking tour and she is censored everywhere. Town Hall in New York in 1921, uh, the police try to stop her from speaking. The crowd lifts her onto the stage, chanting, defy them, defy them. Sanger said she has the right to speak under the constitution. She dares the cops to club her. The cops grab her arms, pull her out of the hall and the crowd breaks into a chorus of my country tis of thee. Um, that's the birth control movement. The birth control movement is a free speech movement um, because again, you can't get the word out about birth control or anything involving women's rights if you don't have free speech. The gay rights movement, exactly the same thing. You may have read that um, uh, right up until the 1950s, there were underground gay magazines and newspapers, uh, including bodybuilding magazines that were popular among gay males. Um, and uh, these magazines were, and newspapers were censored everywhere um, until finally the Supreme Court intervened and said people had the right to publish and read them. And that was hugely important to the flowering of the gay rights movement. I mean, just think about it. An activity and an identity that's highly stigmatized in many places illegal, these magazines help people connect in ways that nothing else could. And um, they were the absolute trigger for the gay rights movement. Um, I, I, um, once that literature wasn't censored, gays could connect and organize in ways that they couldn't before. And you know, the black civil rights movement itself, of course, um, the NAACP and its literature are illegal in several uh, Southern states. That is, it's illegal to be in the NAACP and it's illegal to distribute the crisis, which was of course the magazine started by W.B. Du Bois. Um, and that's why Du Bois and King are free speech warriors. Uh, du Bois called censorship the greatest menace to present civilization. Censorship was what prevented his magazine, The Crisis, from being distributed across the South. Uh, and let me just remind you that when we stop defending free speech, again, people with the least advantage, 
people with the least power will suffer. So just one example before I go on, moving into the 80s, the University of Michigan passed a speech code, um, which was later struck down by the co courts, which is why you might've heard about it. But what does the code say? It bars any behavior, verbal or physical, that stigmatizes an individual on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, sex, or sexual orientation, which sounds great in the face of it, until you read that over the next 18 months, whites charge African-Americans with violating that speech code in 20 different cases. One black student was punished for using the term white trash. Now, again, I wouldn't call that a racist slur, but this is my whole point. It's going to be in the eye of the beholder. Um, uh, uh, what you call racist and what you call sexist, et cetera, is gonna you know, depend on the context and depend on who you are. And once you start banning things like that, they will be turned against you. Um, so that's uh, um, free speech protecting sexual and racial other kinds of minorities. Um, the third one, and I think very close to the heart of Larry Robin is that free speech allows us to create and enjoy the, the art and film and literature um, uh, of our choice. And here's a, another just uh, fantastic uh, cartoon by, uh, um, Singy Wilkinson, uh, we gotta, gotta look in there um, just so we know what to ban. Uh, and Larry knows this, but lots of other people don't. Um, uh, almost every book that we've been taught to consider a classic was at some time banned in the United States, including books by D.H. Lawrence, James Joyce, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, my favorite quote about censorship is from a federal customs inspector in the 20s who's asked what a classic is. How do you define a classic? And he says, well, that's a dirty book that somebody's trying to get by me. That's what a classic is. Uh, and all those authors that I just referred to were censored because they were considered dirty. And not just books, of course, film. And in some ways, the moral panic over film is greater than books because um, you, know, you don't have to read or be able to read to go to a movie. Um, uh, and the idea was also that the pictures are gonna be much more powerful in influencing people's minds and behavior than print. Um, so as soon as there's electronic entertainment, as soon as there's film, there are state censorship boards um, all over the United States. Uh, I'd like to read you what Maryland's censorship board uh, banned. This is in the early 20th century. It banned, and I will quote, suggestive comedy, stories built on illicit love, overpassionate love scenes, disrespect for the law, men and women living together in adultery without marriage, drinking and gambling made attractive, prolonged success to criminals, maternity scenes, titles calculated to stir up racial hatred and antagonistic relations between labor and capital. In other words, everything, sex, violence, and politics. Um, uh, censors order removals of scenes showing women breastfeeding. And this is important, a review board in Memphis rejected a film set in a racially integrated classroom. Uh, they said that would quote, offend the sensibilities of the South, by which they meant of course the white South. And back to Mary Beth Tinker, they weren't wrong about that, right? Did a film showing an integrated classroom offend the sensibilities of the white South? Yes, yes it did. And that's precisely why, again, we can't let offense be the rubric here. Um, more recently, um, there have been efforts to censor film and art that allegedly offends racial minorities and racial sensibilities. Um, the, uh, uh, the most prominent example is uh, the mural at George Washington High School uh, in San Francisco. You may have read about that, but these were created by actually a Marxist painter in the 1930s, uh, um, Viktor Arnatov. Um, who made these two actually beautiful tableaus about the life of George Washington, which show among others, other things, enslaved African-Americans, um, a dead Native American. And um, the San Francisco School Board decided these murals had to come down. And uh, they also said that they should rename the school after Maya Angelou, who is arguably the most uh, illustrious alumna. The only problem with this logic or illogic is that Maya Angelou is herself one of the most censored authors in the history of the United States. 
Um, her book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, is one of the most challenged books of the 20th century. Uh, Maya Angelou is rolling over in her grave at the idea that we're going to take down these murals because they offend somebody. Again, the images are difficult, they're painful, but they're a part of our history. And Maya Angelou argued that we cannot and must not turn away from that. Finally, um, and I'm moving quickly here because obviously I'm much more interested in hearing from you than from me. Um, the fourth reason, um, free speech allows or should allow students and teachers to say what they think in schools. And just one more cartoon here, if I can bring it up. Uh, oh no, sorry, that was the wrong one. Uh, just a minute, here it is. Ah, there it is. Yes, I love this one too. Uh, today's lesson on free speech. And here's the school board's list of things that you are free to say. For most of our history, you haven't been free. Um, students had no free speech rights. The movement for student rights comes out of the campaign, yes, for racial justice. So in 1964, students at a segregated school in Mississippi are suspended for wearing one man, one vote buttons, which were, um, you know, that, that was the, the, the motto of, um, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, it spread next year to several other schools. There's suspensions, there's a student boycott. And finally, a federal court said that these kids do have the right to wear those buttons. Uh, if it doesn't hurt the decorum of school. And that decision would provide that real, really the basis for Tinker v. Des Moines in 1969. Um, uh, the Tinker family had roots in the civil rights movement as well. Mary Beth and John's dad was a Methodist minister. He was pushed out of his previous post for endorsing Black's right to swim in the town pool. Um, uh, the school district tried to argue that these armbands did threaten you know, the decorum of the school the scholarly atmosphere. And Mary Beth Tinker told me that uh, when she went to the, uh, she went to the oral argument, you know, four years later, by that time she's in high school. And she was sitting right below Thurgood Marshall and Thurgood Marshall says to the lawyer for the school district, just how many kids wore armbands? And the lawyer says, well, seven. And Thurgood Marshall says, how many kids are in the school district? And the lawyer says, 18,000. And it was then that Thurgood Marshall's eyes started to droop and he kind of fell asleep, which he did uh, uh, often uh, later on in his life. And that's when Mary Beth knew that they would win because he's like, this is ridiculous. This is not a threat to the decorum of the school. And uh, the decision was written by Justice Fortas. And he said, in our system, state operated schools may not be enclaves of totalitarianism. Can schools restrict speech? Well, sure they can. And we can all imagine situations in which you would want them to restrict speech. Uh, you can't stand up in the middle of math class and call the teacher a racial slur. Um, uh, but if you want to censor a kid's speech, or a teacher's, by the way, you have to show that it will, quote, substantially interfere with day-to-day -day learning, like the example that I just used. Um, you can't just muzzle somebody because you don't like what they're saying. Um, you have to show that what they're saying would pose an immediate risk to the order and the learning of the school. And the Supreme Court just upheld this in a near unanimous decision. Justice Thomas stepped out, but uh, um, uh, uh, in the cheerleader case, very briefly, a cheerleader here in Pennsylvania, um, she was not in school. She was at a convenience store on a Saturday when she discovered that she had not made the cheerleading team. And on Instagram, she tapped out to her 200 followers, fuck cheer, fuck school, fuck everything. Um, somebody took a screenshot of this and it uh, made it to the principal, uh, who then said she can't be on the cheerleading team ever, or maybe for a year or two. Uh, and this worked its way up to the Supreme Court, which a few months ago said, you know what? That didn't threaten learning in the school at all. Look, if she had, again, stood up in the middle of history class and said, 
you know, fuck chi or fuck school, that might have interfered with learning and the school would have been in its rights to do that. But the point here is that the onus is always on the institution, the onus is on the school to show that something really terrible is about to happen. Um, and if they can't, then they've got to let the kids speak. Um, but it is really seductive to censor. Like Holmes was right. Um, there's hateful stuff all around us. And I understand the impulse to muzzle it, to fix it. Um, who wouldn't want to do that, really? But here's, of course, the problem. Once you start muzzling things you don't like, you will be muzzled. Once you decide that something is so hateful that it can't see the light of day, you're going to end up in the darkness. I understand the impulse to censor it. Um, and we should raise our voices against it. There's a lot of hate in this country. And criticizing that hate is a form of free speech in its own right. But that's different from denying speech to someone else, which never ends well. Um, it turns its targets into martyrs. And it betrays a lack of confidence in democracy itself. If we believe in our ability to govern ourselves, we need to let every citizen speak their mind. And we need to have faith that that messy cacophony is going to yield a more just and fair society than any censor is going to create. Frederick Douglass said it best. He said, liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. Douglas was a victim of slavery, the worst crime in America. He knew vastly more about the inequities and brutalities of America than most other Americans did. But Douglas also knew we could never make anything right if we forsook our right to free speech. We've got to remember the brave women and men who raise their voices for justice at great risk to themselves. And we've got to speak up again for free speech, which remains our best vehicle for righting our wrongs. Let free speech ring. Anything less will diminish us all. Thanks a lot. <laughs>